Well, it's good to be in Atlanta. It is good to be in Atlanta, my friends, and I'm going to tell you, in 10 days, we're going to turn Georgia red. We're going to take the whole country with us. We're going to make Donald Trump the next president of the United States. Now, I'm sorry we're a little delayed coming out here. We we're going to come out right behind the bleachers, and somebody said, no, you got you got to come out right here. But we were delayed by 10 seconds in coming out here, and it, it occurred to me as we were walking out that um, that that Kamala Harris – Every time she steps in front of a reporter, she makes a catastrophic mistake. So if we're just 10 seconds late to the stage, I'll take that every day and twice on Sunday. We, we've got a few people here that I want to thank of you, a few very special friends. Uh, we've got Congressman Andrew Clyde here. Andrew, thank you, man. Now, Andrew reminded me, actually, that he and I worked on a piece of legislation, he, he in the House and me in the Senate, where we actually fought back against some of the radical anti-police policies of Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. And what happened? Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, they vetoed that piece of legislation, making Washington, D.C. less safe. And it, it, drives something, it drives something home, my friends, that, you know, when Kamala Harris says that she can't think of anything that she would have done differently from Joe Biden, maybe that's something she should have done differently. Let's support our law enforcement. I know Donald Trump would have done it differently, and that's a thing to be proud of. We've got the great Congressman Mike Collins. Mike, stand up, say hello. I know everybody just saw Mike. Mike has got the best social media, I think, of anybody in the U.S. Congress. No, no offense to anybody else here, no, but, but, but Mike has got the best sense of humor, and he has a little bit of fun with politics, which I think is a good thing. You know, they say that Kamala Harris, the media talks about Kamala Harris being the candidate of joy. When I come... To when I come to events like this, I feel like the joy is all on our side, and we're having fun out here. And of course, we got the great Congressman Rick Allen. Rick, thank you so much for being here, man. Thanks for your leadership. We've got Insurance and Safety Fire Commissioner John King. John, please say hello. Say hello. Thank you, John. And of course, we've got the legendary Alveda King. Where, where is she? There, God bless you, man. Thank you. Now, when you take a uh, when you take a photograph with Miss King, she says right before the, the the click goes, she says Jesus, and I love that because that puts a smile on my face, and it also reminds me, uh, Miss King, that we we are engaged in the most important work, and I think it's fundamentally to make this country friendly to people of faith, to respect people's religious liberties, but I think. The great Christian command for politics is that we pursue the common good. And how can you pursue the common good with a broken leader like Kamala Harris? We're going to get Donald J. Trump back in the White House, and that's what we're going to do. Now, I want to talk, before we get into why we need to elect Donald Trump the next president of the United States, I want to talk about the how. Because the how is really important, and here in Georgia, we are off to a great start, my friends. You look at these early vote totals, and Republicans are doing awfully good in the state of Georgia. By the way, we're doing awfully good in the state of North Carolina. We're doing, we're doing awfully good in the state of Nevada. And across all the battleground states, I right now, if I was a betting person, and sometimes I've been known to gamble from time to time, I would bet on Donald J. Trump winning all seven battleground states and going to the White House with a lot of momentum. But here's, here's the thing. I'm going to make three requests of you before we talk about why it's so important to change the leadership in this country. I want to make three requests of you, and this is the most important thing. Number one. I want every single person in this room, all of you out in front of me and all of you behind me, I want you to go out there and vote 10 times. <laughs> now, some of you got a little uncomfortable. You say, well, we're Republicans. We follow the law. We only vote once, and we vote the legal way. Well, here, here is the legal way to vote 10 times. Take yourself to the polls and take nine of your friends and family with you. We got to do that. 
I want you to make that commitment because we're talking about states that could be decided by thousands or even hundreds of votes. In other words, if every single person gets out and votes 10 times, that could be the difference between President Donald J. Trump and President Kamala Harris. None of us wants that nightmare over the next four years, so please get your friends and family to the polls. And, and, and while we're on the topic, to be clear to our media folks in the back, and we'll take some questions afterwards, I was encouraging them to take their friends and family to the polls. We don't want an Atlanta Journal-Constitution headline tomorrow. J.D. Vance comes to Atlanta and encourages voter fraud. We're talking about voting legally, the ten, legally ten times the right way, uh, so please go and do that. I'm going to make a second request of you. Second request is, wh whether now or at some point during the program, take out your phone, take a photo of either yourself, take a photo of me standing on the stage, Post it to social media and talk about why you're, you, you are going to make Donald J. Trump the next president of the United States. Because we're never going to have, we're never going to have Kamala Harris or the corporate media on our side. We're never going to have them telling the truth about President Trump's successful record in office. But you know who can tell the truth? We can. So let's do that over the next 10 days. Let's talk about why Donald J. Trump was a good president and he will be so again. The third and final request is we, we want everybody to go to this website that we built called SwampTheVoteUSA.com. And I'm going to repeat it, SwampTheVoteUSA.com. we got 10 days ago. What you can do on that website is you can look at your polling location. You can check your registration. You can figure out how to get involved in our great voter turnout efforts. SwampTheVoteUSA.com. As President Trump always says, look. It is what it is. We may not like election season over election day, but it is what it is. And we've got to use every method that we can to get out there and vote. Whether that's vote by mail, whether that's early voting, whether that's voting on election day, make sure you get out there and make your voice heard. If everybody gets out there and votes, we're going to swamp the vote. We're going to prevent Democrat shenanigans, and we're going to make Donald Trump the next president of the United States. Now, there are two big issues confronting this country. There's so many things that we could talk about. We could talk about all of us believe, I think, in school choice and in giving our kids an education at school instead of an indoctrination, right? We, we, all, believe, we all believe in religious liberty, protecting the rights of Christians, Jews, and everybody else to, protect, to, to practice their faith as they see fit. We don't want Kamala Harris telling people of faith how to live their lives. We want people of faith making their communities stronger by living their faith as they see fit. That is the guarantee of the First Amendment. But I think when you talk to our fellow Americans, the two biggest issues confronting our fellow citizens are, number one, the economy, and number two, this terrible crisis at the southern border. So let's talk about both of those. And, and unfortunately, those issues are connected. Because when, remember, when Kamala Harris came into office, she promised that she was going to undo Donald Trump's border policies, and that's exactly what she did. Ninety-four executive orders that did what? They suspended deportations. They stopped Donald Trump's successful Remain in Mexico policy. They stopped the construction of the border wall. Donald Trump built almost 500 million, or excuse me, 500 miles of border wall, and Kamala Harris stopped construction of it on day one. That is why we have a wide open border. That is why Kamala Harris has been a failure as borders are. And that is why the people of Georgia are going to send a message to Kamala Harris in 10 days. We don't want San Francisco liberal policies. We want to close down borders. So Kamala Harris, you're fired. Go back to California where you belong. And we got to talk about the unbelievable human cost of that wide open border. I, I was a few weeks ago in Valdosta, Georgia, of course, a great community in southern Georgia, a community that was hit pretty hard, of course, by Hurricane Helene. So spare prayer for the people in Valdosta who are still rebuilding. But when I was there, it was actually before the hurricane hit. And I saw something that has stayed with me for a very long time on, on the campaign trail. I think about it multiple times a day. Because the sheriffs there, they took me into what's called the interdiction room. Now, this is where they collect all of the drugs and the contraband that they've gotten, a lot of it from the Mexican drug cartels. And, 
you know, Val Valdosta sits there at the intersection of I-10 and I-75, so it's become a major thoroughfare for the Mexican drug cartels who are bringing illegal guns and illegal drugs into our country. Now, in that interdiction room, I saw something that really shocked me, because you've got, you know, bags of marijuana, you've got pills, you've got meth, you've got, you know, refined THC, you've got fentanyl, of course, and then I see something that looks out of place. It's a box of candy, you know, like Nerds Sour Patch candies, and I say to the sheriff, I say, what's going on there? That doesn't look like candy, to, or that doesn't look like illegal drugs to me, and he says, well, the cartels have figured out that if they disguise that candy, or excuse me, if they disguise that drugs as candy, then they're going to make it easier to get it into our country and to poison our citizens with it. And then, of course, I thought, of course, as the father of a seven-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old, that eventually a packet of Nerds or Sour Patch candies is going to end up on an American playground, and an American child is going to open up a packet of candy and pay for it with their lives. This is disgraceful, my friends, and it's going to stop when Donald J. Trump is back in the White House. Because here's the thing, we know that kids make mistakes. All kids make mistakes, especially when they hit those teenage years. And I'm not there yet, but please say a prayer for me because we're going to be there eventually. But I want my children to grow up in a country, I want your children and your grandchildren to grow up in a country where it's safe enough for children to make those stupid childhood mistakes but not have to pay for them with their lives. I want kids... I want kids to learn from those mistakes. I want kids to get a lecture from their parents, maybe get grounded. I don't want them to die from innocent childhood errors because Kamala Harris refuses to do her job. So in 10 days, to all of the friends that we have in the state of Georgia, if you want American communities to be safe again, we've got to close down that southern border, and the only way to do it is with President Trump back in the White House. Now, there are, all, there are so many issues that flow from that wide-open southern border. I mean, think about this. Think, think about the, the, the unbelievable number. I believe it's thousands upon thousands of children who are in Georgia public schools who are the children of illegal aliens. And look, I don't begrudge those children. I certainly don't begrudge anybody for wanting to come to this country for a better life. But number one, you've got to do it the proper way. You've got to come through the proper channels. And, and number two, when you flood our public schools with kids who don't even speak English, what does that do to the education of the children of American citizens? It makes their education worse. What does it do to hospital wait times when you bring in millions upon millions of illegal aliens? We know the answer. Emergency room wait times are up in Georgia. They're up all over the country because we got millions of people who don't have the legal right to be here. And what does it do to housing prices when you've got 25 million illegal aliens who are buying homes, who are living in homes that ought by right go to American citizens? So I've asked all the time, what is the Donald Trump plan to bring down housing costs? And there's a lot of things that we can do. But number one, and most importantly, is we've got to ensure that American homes go to American citizens. And that's only going to happen with Donald J. Trump back in the White House. Because, you know, I, I think all of us are affected by the problems of Kamala Harris's leadership differently. All of us process this a little bit differently. We've all got different friends and family. But because I'm the first millennial on a major party ticket, I talk to a lot of people in my generation. And a consistent theme that I hear from them is our parents' generation, they were able to afford to buy a home, and our generation is not. And what a terrible failure of leadership that is. How, how much have the present leaders of this country failed our citizens when young people don't feel like they can afford the American dream of homeownership? That, I, I, we, my friends, we can do so much better. We have to do so much better. And unless we fire Kamala Harris, we're not going to do so much better. So let's do exactly that. Now, that leads us into another issue, of course, because we don't – we got to, of course, most importantly, we got to make sure that American homes go to American citizens, but we also have to build more houses to begin with. 
And we're not going to build more homes unless we stop the ridiculous Kamala Harris regulations that have made it harder to build, made it harder to, build, to do business, and made it harder to develop energy in the United States of America. So the most, the most important method, the most important way that President Trump is going to lower prices for American citizens, it's very simple. Drill, baby, drill. We got to open up American energy. Because because think about this, when when you make the price of energy more expensive, when you when you say, for example, make a truck driver pay 45 percent more for diesel fuel then the groceries that that truck driver is delivering to the grocery store, they get more expensive. When the guy who's delivering lumber to the construction site is paying 40 percent more for gasoline, then, of course, all of us are paying more for what that job site is building. We got to get back to common sense energy policies, and it's, I think it's worthwhile to compare and contrast not just the economic record, but also the economic agenda of Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Kamala Harris wants us to buy oil and gas from tin pot dictators all over the world. Donald Trump wants us to buy oil and gas from our own people because we got plenty of it in the United States of America. Let's get it out of the ground and create prosperity in the process. Kamala Harris wants to raise taxes on American workers and reward companies that ship American jobs overseas. And I've, you know, I've never seen a politician in my life, even the politicians who want to raise your taxes, they'll lie about it and say they want to cut your taxes during the campaign. Kamala Harris is going out there bragging about raising taxes by $2,600 per family on Georgia residents. I've never seen anything like it. Now, Donald Trump, of course, not only does he want to cut your taxes, he already did. He cut your taxes when he was in office, and he's going to do it more. But if Kamala Harris wants to raise your taxes and reward companies that ship jobs overseas, Donald Trump thinks that gets it exactly upside down. When President Trump is back in the office, we're going to cut your taxes, and we're going to penalize companies that ship American jobs overseas, not give them tax breaks. Kamala Harris, of course, wants to open the border, and Donald Trump already shut down the border, and when he's president in just a couple of months, he's going to shut it down again. <laughs> Kamala Harris sends a message to illegal aliens all over the world saying, come into our country, because she wants to give them Social Security and Medicare benefits that have been paid for by American citizens. She does. She brags about it. Donald Trump's approach to preserving Social Security and Medicare is to ensure that it goes to the American people who have paid into it, not to people who don't have the right to be in our country. And while Kamala Harris is rolling out the red carpet for people who have no legal right to be in this country, giving them benefits paid for by American taxpayers, five-star hotel rooms paid for by American taxpayers, you know what Donald Trump's message is to illegal aliens all over the world? Pack your bags, stop coming to this country, and if you are in this country in four months, we're sending you back home. The record is so clear, that, and that's one of the good things. I got to say, my friends, I, I honestly feel a little bad for Tim Walz, the governor of Minnesota. I do. I do. Think about it. He's got the hardest job in American politics, and I've got the easiest job in American politics. All I've got to do is go around and talk about that, not, not just that Donald Trump has good plans for a golden age of prosperity, but that when he was president, inflation was 1.5 percent. I, I get to go around and talk about when Donald Trump was president, take-home pay was rising faster than it had in 40 years in the United States of America. I, I get to go around and brag that when my running mate was president, groceries were affordable, housing was affordable, and the border was shut down and closed. But Tim Waltz has got to talk somehow about how Kamala Harris is going to solve the very problems that she created. And that is a very tough job. Remember, T Tim Waltz has got to somehow convince the American citizens that Kamala Harris didn't open the border when everybody with a lick of common sense knows that's exactly what she did. 
Remember when Kamala Harris, she, she goes to these rallies, and she stands up there and she says, on day one, we're going to tackle the affordability crisis affecting American families. And on day one, we're going to secure that southern border. And I think all of us, with any common sense, are saying, Kamala, day one was 1,400 days ago. What the hell have you been doing the whole time? Get to work. Do your job. So, so Tim Walsh has got to pretend that somehow Kamala Harris is going to be the candidate of change. That somehow the candidate who has been the sitting vice president for the last three and a half years is going to be doing something different over the next four years that she hasn't already done. Tim Walsh has got to convince the American people that the very affordability crisis that exploded under Kamala Harris's leadership is somehow going to get better if we give her a promotion. So I think we ought to spare a prayer for Tim Walls because the American people know the truth about Kamala Harris. She's not the candidate of change. Kamala Harris is the candidate of un unaffordable groceries. She's the candidate of higher housing crisis. Kamala Harris is the candidate of more of the broken leadership of Washington, D.C., and the state of Georgia is going to have nothing to do with it. Now, we, we also, you know, the reason I feel bad for Tim Walz is because as much as they talk about joy, I think at, at our events, whether it's President Trump's events or, or our VP events, look, we are the campaign of joy. You can feel it in the Republican Party. You can feel it for independents and Democrats that are supporting the president because I think that all of us can feel, one, that we're winning but most importantly, that we're about to fire Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and put a president who actually cares about the American people back in the White House. But, you know, the, the other reason I'm feeling especially joyful is because, uh, you know, again, here I am. You, you maybe didn't expect me to be so bipartisan today. But I said something nice about Tim Walz, and let, let me say something nice about Kamala Harris. I think that every time she does an interview, we gain about 100,000 votes. And I, I feel sometimes like we've actually got three people running on our ticket because not only does Kamala Harris give us a bunch of votes every time that she gives an interview, but she also copies every single one of our proposals. And, and I keep thinking to myself, Kamala Harris, if, if you're so confident in what you want to do, and more importantly, in what you have done for the American people, why do you keep on just copying Donald Trump's policy proposals? Now, we, we've, we've, of course, announced a policy of no taxes on tips. Donald Trump is going to eliminate taxes on tips. Donald Trump has talked about eliminating taxes on overtime workers. I think that's really important. A lot of these folks are working too hard. They ought to get a raise. Donald Trump, of course, talks about securing the border. we got to do that, right? And I think that Kamala Harris, after Donald Trump started talking about it, Kamala Harris copied every single one of those proposals. And I was talking to the president a few weeks ago about this. I said, sir, I actually think I figured it out. She thinks you're going to win, and she's auditioning for my job. She, I'm telling you, she's going to show up in Michigan today with a red MAGA hat and a long red tie, and she, that, that is how she's going to run her campaign these final 10 days, is she's copied Donald Trump on everything else. She might as well copy his style, too. But here's the thing. Here's the thing is Kamala Harris is betting on us being stupid. She's betting on the American people being too dumb to realize that she's lying to them. But Donald Trump and I, you know what we're betting on? We're betting on the wisdom and the common sense of the American people. That's why we're going to win in 10 days. Now, we, we got to remember, of course, that Kamala's entire campaign argument is that she is somehow going to fix the problems that she's been creating for the last three and a half years. But she, she does an interview with The View a couple weeks ago. Did you see this interview with The View? Some of you did, but most of you, th th this is how I sacrifice as running for your next vice president is I watch Kamala Harris on The View so that most of you don't have to. Now, I, 
I don't recommend it because I think you lose about 20 IQ points every time you do. But in this interview, they asked her, Kamala Harris, are you going to do, would you have done anything different from how Joe Biden did it over the last four years? And again, her whole argument is, yes, she's going to be different. But in that moment with a softball interview, the softball interview, Kamala Harris says nothing comes to mind. Now, in defense of Kamala Harris, maybe that should be the slogan of the whole campaign. Nothing comes to mind. But Mike, Mike, like, Mike liked that one. But, but the, the thing is, I think that it reveals to the people of Georgia on a serious note that she is not the candidate of change. Kamala Harris is the candidate of more of the same. Kamala Harris is the candidate of unaffordable groceries. Kamala Harris is the candidate of higher housing prices. Donald Trump is the candidate of making the American dream affordable again. We got to get him there. Let's fight to get Donald Trump back in the White House. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one more observation here about Kamala Harris's campaign, and then I'm going to take some questions from reporters. Here's, here's the problem. It's not just that I disagree with Kamala Harris on, on policy, on substance. It's that Kamala Harris has run this campaign around censorship instead of persuasion. Now, whatever your views are, whatever, whether you disagree or agree with me and President Trump on a particular issue, I'm going to make a solemn promise to you that we're going to fight for the First Amendment and we're going to fight for your right to speak your mind, even and maybe especially when you disagree with us. Because, you know, we talk about this border crisis, and, and, and the thing, obviously, the policy is terrible, but then you realize it's not just that Kamala Harris refuses to acknowledge that the border is a disaster, it's that Kamala Harris wants to call her fellow citizens a racist for daring to believe that we ought to have a secure southern border. Well, here's my message to Kamala Harris. Stop censoring your fellow citizens. Try to persuade them, and you might actually get somewhere in American politics. Stop telling people that they're racist because they want their children to go to schools with kids who speak the English language. Stop telling American citizens that they're bad people because they don't want fentanyl flooding their communities. Stop telling the American people they don't deserve to have s smaller hospital wait times. Stop telling the American people that they're bad for wanting a secure southern border. You're not a bad person. We're not bad people for wanting security in our own neighborhoods. Kamala Harris is a bad person for doing this to the country to begin with. And, and, and on that note, let's go ahead and take some questions from hopefully some local reporters and then the national folks if we've got time. Senator Vance, Molly Oak with 11 Alive News. Um, I'm curious, as you close in on Election Day, we're seeing record-breaking turnout in our area. How do you feel the per uh, campaign is performing in battleground states, specifically here in Georgia? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Look, I, I really, I'm not BSing anybody in this room. I think that we're winning the state of Georgia right now. I really do. And I think that... And honestly, my, my biggest concern is complacency down the stretch. Because if, if the election were held tomorrow, I'm 100% confident Donald Trump is the next president of the United States. And that's a very good thing. But, but the election is not tomorrow. The election is 10 days from now. And so what we have to do is keep our, our foot on the gas. We've got to keep on working. We've got to keep on running through the finish line. Because I really do believe that our, our, our fellow citizens are ready for a change. They're ready to make the American dream more affordable again. They're ready to make groceries more affordable again. They're ready to make housing more affordable again, especially for our young citizens. They're ready to close down that southern border and stop the flow of this poison into our country. They're ready for new leadership, and Donald J. Trump is the only person on the ballot who's going to provide that new leadership. So we're going to win. I really believe that. 
Senator Vance, Greg Bluestein from Bit Manager General Constitution. Thanks for the shout out to our outlet earlier in your speech. You're welcome. I was just kidding. Oh, we, we'll take it. Uh, my question is about the Republican turnout. The Republican turnout is soaring in many parts of the state in a way that it just wasn't in 2020. What do you think took it so long for Republican voters to embrace early turnout, early voting in states like Georgia? You know, I, I think there are a few things, right? I, I, think, I think, first of all, look, leadership matters, and I think that a lot of Republicans have faith in the leadership of the Republican Party in 2024 that they maybe didn't, I'm talking about the RNC, that they didn't four years ago. And I think that if you look at what the RNC has done on election integrity, when you look at this, for example, the state of Georgia has passed laws about voter ID and signature verification. <laughs> So I think at both the state level from Brian Kemp on down, but also the RNC with, with Michael Watley and Lara Trump at, at the head, I think that Republican voters have more confidence in early voting this year. And look, I've got more confidence in early voting this year. So I'd encourage all of us to get out there, vote early if you're able to, because it's how we're going to, you know, get enough votes in the bank so that we make sure that Donald Trump wins the state of Georgia. So look, I, I feel good about early voting. I feel good about where we are in election integrity. And I think it sends an important message. You know, there's, there's of course, after 2020, there was this big debate about the 2020 election. And what I never understood is whether you agreed with me and President Trump about some of the criticisms that we made four years ago, why not try to make American elections more secure, right? What, what, why not do, if the American people are telling you they're worried about election integrity, why not do voter ID? Why not do signature matching for mail-in ballots? Why not make it harder for illegal aliens to vote? And, you know, pe people, you know, so, some, of my, some of my Democratic friends will say, well, we don't think there are that many illegal aliens voting. Well, then why not make it even harder, right? The, the, the proper number of illegal aliens voting in American elections is zero. So let's get it to zero. So I, I actually think Georgia has set a really good standard, and I think every single state in the union ought to have voter ID, and that's how you give people confidence in our elections. And I think if people followed suit and did what Georgia has done, we'd have much better elections and we'd all have more confidence in it. And both of those things are important. Next question. Hey, thanks, Senator. Uh, I'm Ross Williams with the Georgia Recorder. Uh, Vice President Harris, Harris has been campaigning strongly on the abortion question. I wanted to ask you, do you believe that abortion is morally equivalent to murder? And if so, how do you justify leaving it up to the states to decide? Yes, sir. So my, my belief on the policy of abortion, and it's important to, to reiterate that. And what President Trump has said is that the voters are going to make the decision about abortion. What his presidency is going to be focused on is lowering the price of housing, lowering the price of groceries, securing that southern border, and, and most importantly, promoting a culture of life in this country. Because we've got way too many people who feel, you know, if they have an unexpected pregnancy, we've got way too many young women who feel like their only option is to terminate that pregnancy. We want to increase the options. We want to make it easier for people to choose life because we believe that that's important. Now, now you ask me about my personal views. Look, my personal views are that it is important to save as many vulnerable lives as possible. That's my view. And I think the best way for us, because I recognize that there are people who are pro-choice, there are people who are pro-life, there are people who are pro-life in some circumstances, but pro-choice in others. The way for us to have a real conversation as a nation is to let the voters make these decisions, which is why Donald Trump believes in the policy that he does. Thank you. Senator Vance, Tim Luffler with Fox 5. My question, now that we're 10 days out from the election, what is your number one message to any undecided voters that we have here in Georgia? I think our number one message, very simply, is that when Donald Trump was president, we had peace, we had prosperity, we had affordable groceries and affordable housing. Kamala Harris has been the vice president for the last three and a half years. 
We have unaffordable groceries. We have a world at chaos, and we have a wide open southern border. So let's just compare the records of these two candidates. You don't have to agree with everything that I say or with everything that President Trump says, but who can disagree that we had rising take-home pay and a secure southern border? Wouldn't we all like to get back to that? But the only way... The, the only way to get back to it is to change the broken leadership in Washington, D.C. We cannot get back to peace and prosperity. We cannot get back to affordable groceries and a secure southern border by doing the same exact things with the exact same leaders. We need change. We need new leadership. We need Donald J. Trump. That's our message to voters down the stretch. Next question. Senator, I'm Sarah Callis with GBB News. Will you accept the Georgia results of the election, even if you do not win the state? Yes, ma'am. Of, look, of, of, of course we will. But of course, we're going to try to make sure that every legal ballot is counted and illegal ballots aren't counted, right? There's no... We, we believe in two very important principles. One, that yes, we're going to accept the results of the election, but two, we're also going to fight to make sure that every legal ballot and only every legal ballot is count, counted in the state of Georgia. Thank you. Hi, Senator. It's Kit. I'm, I'm wondering if, what have you heard about Chinese hackers targeting your phone and Trump's phone? Well, I've heard that they did it, which, which sucks. And I think it illustrates, frankly, the Chinese aren't trying to hack Kamala Harris and Tim Walz's phone. I, I think, frankly, they'd probably find, probably find some pretty weird stuff if they hacked into Kamala Harris and Tim Walz's phone. But that's just a guess. That's not a factual statement. That's merely one man's opinion, to be clear, Kit. But I, I, I think that what it shows is that the Chinese recognize that Kamala Harris provides weak leadership and Donald Trump provides strong leadership. So they're trying to do everything they can to prevent Trump from getting back in the White House. Hi, Senator. This is Hannah Demise with ABC News. My question for you is, do you have any reaction to the Wall Street Journal report about Elon Musk and Russian President Vladimir Putin being in contact since um, October 2022? And do you have any concerns about the national security aspect of it? Yeah, so I have, I have two responses to it. And so first of all, Elon is a friend, and obviously he's a big supporter of the president and of mine. We're, we're grateful for his support, but I'm not a spokesperson, right? So I'm not going to stand up here and try to pretend that I know everything that Elon Musk has ever done. But the, the second thing that occurs to me about this is it's almost like the Democrats are running the exact same playbook from 2016, but with different names and different times. Here, 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 here's, here's what I know about Elon Musk. I, I, I know that there are a lot of people in areas that were hit hard by Hurricane Helene who have internet service because Elon Musk has been working hard to make that happen. I, I know that Elon Musk represents something that really matters to me about the next generation of American entrepreneurship. I want people building rockets to go to Mars. That is a great and inspiring thing for our country. And if, if, if you think about it, it illustrates something that's really broken. Just consider this. Our parents and grandparents, they went to Mars, or excuse me, they went to the moon with pocket calculators and slide rulers. Americans can't even build enough housing for our citizens now. I think that suggests something fundamentally broken. And what I like about Elon Musk is that he reminds us that America is a nation of great ambitions, of great dreams. And I believe that it is the, it is the solemn obligation of the American civilization to conquer the stars. We are meant for great things in the United States of America. And Elon reminds us of that. But I, look, I, I also know that Elon Musk thinks that it's crazy for the war in Russia and Ukraine to go on indefinitely. And by the way, he's right. It is crazy. And so Donald Trump is the president of not just prosperity. That's the most important thing is prosperity for our citizens. Donald Trump is also the candidate of peace all over the world. The war... The war in Ukraine would have never started if Donald Trump was president. And I believe, 
And I really do believe there is only one person who's running for president, one person maybe in American politics, who could actually bring peace to Russia and Ukraine, and his name is Donald Trump. So please, let's get out there and make him president. Let's do, uh, let's do one more question, then we'll hit the road. Yeah, Senator Torian Small with CBS News. Thanks again for taking our questions. Uh, you've often talked about the big tent that this ticket is, is bringing in, support from Elon Musk, RFK, Tulsi Gabbard, Nikki Haley. All but one have campaigned for the, uh, the ticket. Is there a reason why Nikki Haley hasn't been tapped to campaign? When was the last time you guys have talked to her about campaigning? Well, look, first of all, we're thrilled to have Nikki Haley's support, and I'd love to go around and campaign with, with Nikki Haley, uh, and maybe that'll happen. I mean, sometimes these things are just a consequence of scheduling. You've got to put multiple people in multiple places. So I don't know the answer for why she hasn't been out on the trail, but she's endorsed us. She spoke on behalf of Donald Trump at the RNC, and you're right that we've got Bobby Kennedy, Nikki Haley, Brian Kemp, Tulsi Gabbard. We're the party of common sense from the right and the left. But, but I, I really do think this, this is important, because you ask yourself, why, what candidate can unite Bobby Kennedy Jr., Tulsi Gabbard, Nikki Haley, and Brian Kemp? And the answer is the guy who stands for common sense. And I really think that's fundamentally what this election is about. You know, Ka Kamala Harris, she's, she's the candidate of being the policeman of the world. She's the candidate of starting wars, whereas Donald Trump is the candidate of ending wars. Kamala Harris is the candidate of censoring her fellow citizens. Donald Trump is the candidate of the First Amendment. That's why Bobby Kennedy, I think, is really behind us. And Kamala Harris is the candidate of rising prices, and Donald Trump is the candidate of the American dream. And thank God for that, because we're going to make him president in 10 days. So let me, let me just leave you with, with one final thought, because, you know, I, I really, we're having a lot of fun. And I had fun here today, and I hope you did too, but we're having fun in the service of giving the American people better leadership. We're running this campaign. We're fighting for the American people to have better leadership because as much as I'm looking forward to November the 5th, and trust me, probably more than any person in this room, I am looking forward to beating Kamala Harris and the Democrats on November the 5th. We got to remember that we're, we're fighting for our fellow citizens. We're not just fighting to beat Kamala Harris. We're fighting to make sure that our fellow citizens are able to live a good life in this country that all of us love. And, and, and I want you to, let me just give you a, a few stories. People that I've met on the campaign trail, people that I know, and how much they've suffered under the leadership of the last few years. Number one, I want to, there's a woman I met who's a retiree, and her husband is about to be a retiree, but unfortunately, he's still got a couple years where he's got to work, in part because they're raising grandchildren who were orphaned by the fentanyl crisis. So she's doing the best thing in the world, taking care of grandbabies that she wasn't expecting to take care of, and God love her for doing that. But she told me that in good times and bad, for 40 years, she and her husband had a tradition where they would do steak night on Friday night. And I'm not talking about going to a fancy steakhouse. I'm, I'm talking about going to the grocery store, buying a steak, grilling out, and having that be their special thing. And I think all of us know that it's these little rituals with friends and family that make life worthwhile in the first place. Well, you know what, what happened is she stopped doing steak night last year. And the reason she stopped doing steak night is because groceries got too unaffordable for her to continue on with this tradition that she had done for 40 years. And what a disgrace that is, that a woman who has worked hard and played by the rules her whole life is going without because we have a failed leader like Kamala Harris who's jacked up the price of groceries. I want to tell you about somebody else. Uh, I, I meet a lot of people on the campaign trail, and you know, one woman in particular, she, she talked to me about not being able to afford the price of groceries. She told me about that for about 30 seconds, and then she told me, and, and Ms. King, I think you'll appreciate that, that she said a prayer for me, 
every single night, and not just me, but my wife, and she knew the names of our three children, because even though she couldn't afford to put food on the table, she thought that it was important to pray for me and my family every single day. That reveals a generosity of spirit. Thank you. That reveals a generosity of spirit that exists in this country that we should all be grateful for, but we should remember that when we go to the polls on November the 5th. Because we should remember that there's a retiree out there who would like to be able to reestablish a ritual, a Friday night steak night with her husband, but she's not going to be able to do it unless we get better leadership. There's a woman out there with the generosity of spirit to pray for me and my children by name when she can't even afford the price of groceries. We've got the best country in the world, my friends. We've got the best people. We've got the best natural resources. We've got the most beautiful country anywhere in the world. But for our people to be unleashed into the next age, a golden age of American prosperity, we have got to fix the broken leadership in Washington, D.C. In 10 days together, that's exactly what we're going to do. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and I'm sure I'll be back soon. Take care.